That's what Zach says here, Your Honor. Zach? Adults that you know when I um, what is that simply a hate crime cornerstone there it's in the PME. I was talking to a lady the other day who's trying to launch a ranch like that, mm -hmm. but she would well plug it in. Okay, as soon as it is, get on that chat. She's from I think in the Waco area and she's trying to build a some equine therapy type mm -hmm. of a place. Is that what your daughter does? They don't have equine, but they have, it's 42 acres in McKinney, and um, they have a wonderful art program. In fact, they have a, uh, coming up in November, that they have their annual art auction, and these, these special needs adults, they're, they're all young adults, you know, 20 to 30, around there. Um, they're an incredible artist. It's am amazing what they can do. So they have a, their, their annual art auction, and, um, but they do everything from helping in, you know, like soup kitchens and churches, and they back up their homes, and they have, you know, a whole bunch of technologies in it. They are a, just a fantastic residence center, and um, people just rave over it. They can't, they have a waiting list. They're about to open up another, they're about to break ground on a brand new one. Wow. So. How many people are they serving at a time? Right now, they only have eight that are resident, but they have day programs that, you know, I don't know how lots in turn the day programs. Wow. But then they're opening another one. I think it's going to have like 20. Maybe. And how long do people stay there? Based on their originals. I mean, there, there may be one or two that are new. But, uh, I mean, that one original that have come on since. But, you know, it's just like, you know, I think the most people out of town get really, you know, they're, they're, they're scared whenever they get, you know, older years and they realize they have a special needs, you know, adult that's like 20 years old. What are they going to do when they're gone? And so this is what the, the, the waiting list for this is uh, wow. it's, it's, it's fantastic and they yeah, are she connect us if you wouldn't let her know love to have her and she talk about and her it. husband some of the nice things about the program because of the way that the, all the pieces have fallen together it's just it's just God mm -hmm. you know we couldn't afford this house God did that mm -hmm. we couldn't afford to set up the studio God did that mm -hmm. Brenda Crouch designed all this stuff mm -hmm. for nothing and I'm like it, it's just it's been insane it's mm -hmm. like I was telling you before the programming around the world part of the fact that we were invited to do a daily show and then nas it would be spread nationally mm -hmm. as a weekly program mm -hmm. and so we we've got when we finish today we'll have 38 programs in the can mm -hmm. they will be run and run again mm -hmm. all over the world so the exposure opportunity is huge yeah. and it, it's just been a god thing you know we're just we're learning yeah. we're branding we have no idea what we're doing yeah. <laughs> Ministry things. here too, in a lot of ways. I mean, old but new. You know, we got a new thing going, so it's God's just redirecting a lot of my steps. Amen. Uh, it's in the top pocket of my yellow bag, which is on my side of the bed. Looks pretty good. Yes. Uh, quiet in there. Why? Hey, welcome Facebook friends. I am here with, do you go by Vicki or Victoria? Both. Okay, so <laughs> Dr. Victoria Cervati. So if you're connected on Facebook, you can find her in my friends list. And remind me the name of your fan page. It's Dr. Victoria Cervati. Dr. Victoria Cervati mm -hmm. is the fan page. And so I want you to, to connect with her. I want you to like the page. And I want you to share this interview because we're gonna talk about some things here that are probably a little bit different than what the average Meet the Messenger interview is going to be, number one. Number two, we're, we may step on some toes because there are some ideas out there that have been, because of Christianity's self-protective nature, have been um, swept under the carpet, perhaps, or uh, not fully vetted. And we believe things that really are lies. And I know that sounds mean and cruel, but the more you dig into the truth, the more you have a passion to find the truth, the more he will be found by you because he promised he would. That's right. So we're going to talk about some of those things today. We're also going to talk about how God has used various life experiences, good ones and bad ones, 
to reveal himself in unusual ways. So we're going to ignore you for now. Uh, thanks again to our sponsor, Insperity, for taking care of our snack for our guests today, as well as providing some of our online opportunities. So if you get a chance to call Frank Day, he's uh, right here in the Dallas area, 214-699-9650. And I'm going to ignore you now and turn to our studio camera. So y'all be quiet out there. You're just behind scenes. Are we rolling everywhere? Not yet? One more? All righty. Hey, welcome to Meet the Messenger. I am your host, J. Lauren Norris, and we are here in studio today with Dr. Victoria Servati. And we're going to have some interesting conversation. You know, if you've watched Meet the Messenger for any length of time, you know that one of our core beliefs is that the pimp and the pope can both see Jesus. But because of their life experiences, they don't see a different Jesus, they just see Jesus differently. And as we talk today with a theologian, a genuine theologian teaches at one of the greatest theological schools in the United States at Dallas Theological Seminary. No, that's not right. <laughs> uh, where is it? Well, actually, I'm, I'm an itinerate speaker. An itinerate. Yes, okay. So, right. so an itinerate speaker, but you do speak there. No, is I'm not never, there at all? never spoke okay. there. Don't know where that came Stop. from. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure either. Stop the cameras so we can delete that segment. Hey, Facebook Live. Yes, don't stop that one. You're behind the scenes. You get to see all the stupid mistakes because I'm human, <laughs> and it's weird like that. That's okay. And we're going to delete all that part, and it'll be easy to see because it'll be a very short memory part. Uh, we'll need to restart the timer as well. All right, so you're an itinerant speaker yep. on... It's, it's whoever calls and asks, okay. but, but, you know. But I your can, doctorate's can, degree is in? It's in first century Christianity. First century Christianity. Yes. Okay, perfect. Is that done there? Yeah. All right, we're going to restart all cameras. <coughs> <coughs> I mean, you can see he's in the next break. All right. Okay. Yes, you're still behind the scenes. Isn't this awesome? <laughs> live TV. There's nothing like it. And that's why we're not completely live just on Facebook. Hey, welcome to Meet the Messenger. I am your host, J. Lauren Norris. And we have in studio with us today, Dr. Victoria Sarbati. Now, you know, if you've watched Meet the Messenger for any length of time, that we truly believe that both the pimp and the pope can see Jesus. But because of their life experiences, they see him differently. Not a different Jesus, just a different perspective. And today we're going to talk about some of those subject matter uh, the issues of life that come up that allow us to see Christ revealed in a different way. And we have a true professional in the field. Dr. Victoria Servati has a, an actual doctorate's degree in New Testament and original history of Christianity, right? First century. Mm -hmm. First century Christianity, which is, is an unusual thing all by itself. But the experiences of life and the education in the field uh, give, a, give us some opportunity to dig into some new perspectives as well. So help me welcome, if you will, Dr. Victoria Servati. Thank, Thank you for being you. here today. Appreciate it. Now, we were talking a little bit before we went on about the story that brought you to the conclusions you hold today. Mm -hmm. And I think we all have exactly the same way of discovering. And by that, I mean God allows us to experience things, situations, relationships, incidences in life through which we develop our understanding of him. Mm -hmm. And some of us experience those lessons and learn from them. And some of us experience those lessons and we learn nothing. Well, and, he'll and keep on trying to, so to get so our attention. Keep taking that test again, right? <laughs> yes. So tell me about, you were telling me a little bit about your journey through various, um, some would say religions. I, I'll separate that because I recognize the difference between a religion and a denomination. Right. So tell me about your journey through various denominations that brought you to the conclusions you hold today. Well, it started out when I was 18 years old. I was raised in the Lutheran faith, and it's a very high liturgical you know, um, church that, that deals with a lot of formality. Uh, but, of course, the gospel is preached, and it was in that church that I received my salvation. So, um, you know, I, it's, all churches have an element of truth because when the reformers from the, the Dark Ages came out of the Dark Ages and, and, and became we they begin to realize the truth of the Word of God. They all have these nuggets that they 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 centered their doctrinal or denominational beliefs around. And so we, I, I understood that I was saved by grace through faith, that it wasn't of my works. 
Ephesians so 2, 9 and Exactly. 10. This okay. is what the Lutheran faith is really based on. And so I received my salvation in that church. Um, but it wasn't until I was about 18 years old, almost 19 years old, had a teenage um, marriage, teenage pregnancy, and I um, found myself in uh, some very scary waters as the pregnancy was going along and I was getting very sick. And through a, a series of events, I literally had a clinical death. And what I experienced in that those moments where I was out of my body, it began to change, obviously, the way I looked at my spirituality. And I, after that was over with, I'm, I'm sure we'll get into some of that later, but I began to realize that the denomination I was in, when my pastor came and said, no, we were able to baptize your son before he passed away, so you can rest assured he's in heaven, I questioned him on that doctrinal foundation uh, of our tenet of faith that required infant baptism. And so um, it was just something that didn't sit right with me. I mean, outside of that situation, I could accept that tenet. But when I was actually dealing with that aspect in my life and a child that has passed away, and whether or not he was baptized or not while he was alive, then all of a sudden that became a very important issue to me. And, and so we had friends who were Baptists, and I thought, well, what better friends to ask about baptism than a Baptist? They should be the experts. Exactly. And so got involved with the Baptist church, and we learned so much about evangelism and sharing our testimony and, and you know, finding out that, that element of our faith that we could share with others and, and bring others into the kingdom. And that was wonderful, and we felt so, such fulfillment in that and being a part of an evangelical outreach. But after a while, then I began to realize that I had friends that needed healing. I had situations in my life that needed an intervention of the Holy Spirit in my life. And so when I began to ask questions about the Holy Spirit, I was told that we believe in dispensation and that doesn't happen today. And um, so I found some friends that actually believed in the, the, the gifts of the Spirit and began to um, go to their church. And, and I found that indeed I could be baptized in the Holy Spirit and I received that gift. And, and from that point on, there was a whole new realm of spiritual understanding for me and understanding my authority in Christ and understanding that, that he works through me in the gifts of the Spirit. And these are promises that he gives us. And uh, then eventually I, I started reading the, the Bible and I found that there were some things about the, the Old Testament concerning the, the, the uh, Feast of the Lord. And I thought, what are these? You know, I, what are these Feasts of the Lord? And I asked my pastor about that, and she said, well, those are not for us. Those are for the Jews. And I thought, what part of my Bible is not for me? And so I began that, to— That alone is an interesting question because there are a lot of people today when you talk about faith, right. you talk about healing, you talk about the Holy Spirit, you talk about—I uh, I believe it's uh, in all four Gospels in some phrase or another. He says, greater works than me right. will you do? And just laying that question, what part of my Bible— isn't for me. Right. Now that is a profound way of looking at, at faith and Christianity as a religion all on its own. Exactly. So I, uh, we actually moved and I started going to a, a, a different church and the pastor uh, who was a spirit-filled uh, pastor had a Messianic believer in that did a Passover, Messianic Passover supper. And I was just enthralled with what understanding who my Jesus was from a perspective of the first century. Now, was this like a cedar meal? Yeah, a cedar meal. Mm -hmm. A cedar meal. And yeah. so you walked through the whole process of the symbolism of this is why we do this, and exactly. this is why we eat this piece now, and this is what this flavor or texture mm -hmm. represents. And I, I've experienced that only uh, this year. My faith from two exploded people. whenever I, you know, <laughs> I was experiencing this, saying, "Oh my goodness, this is the church needs to know this. This is a part of who we are. It's the roots of our faith that we have been cut off from." And, um, you know, Jesus was a first century rabbi. He was a teacher. He, was, he had followers that were all Jewish. You know, our faith is from Judaism. And we Christians sometimes forget that this is where we came from. It's the mother. It's the matrix of our faith. I was talking with Dr. Randy Weiss not too long ago, and he said a statement that floored me. He said, understand that the first, I think he said, 13 popes were Jews. Amazing. And people go, wait, no, 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 the Pope is a Catholic idea. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, but what was Peter? Because Peter didn't know what a exactly. Christian was. Peter didn't know what, what, a, what a Catholic was. Peter had never seen a church of Christians. 
they were actually called the bishops of the, the Jerusalem church, uh, in, which was that part of that first few centuries um, when, the, when the faith started. The, but the faith has been here for 3,500 years. You know, when actually before that, when, when uh, Abraham crossed, in, uh, crossed over, actually the word cross over as he, as he crossed over into another faith. I mean, he came from a very pagan faith. He lived in Ur, which is ancient Persia, or Persia, ancient Iran. Iran. And he was the very first Hebrew. And to cross over, that's what Hebrew means. And so he crossed over from paganism into understanding who the God of Abraham is and was. Wow. And, and eventually, you know, these, the, this, co this covenant made with Abraham was made with, with his son and with his grandson. And then eventually, all 12 tribes of his grandson, Jacob, became Israel. And uh, over a series of, event of events and time, God divorced himself from 10 of those tribes. You know, a lot of people think, well, the Jews are the ones who received the, the Torah on Mount Sinai. Remember, it, there were 12 tribes around Mount Sinai. Judah was one of them. But there was a divorce when God actually divorced away his, those 10 tribes and kept one, he kept before him one tribe, is what the scripture says, because he, of his covenant with King David and wow. with, with, with the Messiah. The Messiah was going to come through the, the tribe of Judah. And so the, the, the Jewish tribe, Judah, was kept. All the rest were assimilated into all the, into all the nations. And uh, because Judah was a, a kingdom, it also had two other tribes connected to it, and they became national Jews. So Benjamin, Levi, it was scattered. And, of course, we had some Simeonites. Okay, so when we, when we hear now that in the end times, that part of the story behind or the, or the human experience behind the book of the Revelation that that revelation includes a recalling of all of the Jews back to the land of Israel. Ezekiel says it as well. There is going to be, he says God will whistle. And he knows where they all are. He knows where. Now are these all 12 tribes? Or all just 12 the tribes. And you got to realize nobody knows if they're a Gadite or a Reubenite or an Issacharite. You know, nobody knows where those tribes are. They are literally lost. The scripture says they are assimilated into the nations, and that's where they are today. But there will be a day when God will whistle, and he will bring them back to the land. Now, I don't know if he's going to literally do this supernaturally. The script, when you read the script, scriptures, Ezekiel 32, it, it, it almost sounds like it's supernatural. It almost sounds like it's a rapture, you know, rapturing these these. Um, tribes from the nations where they are into the land of Israel and they will once again walk this land they will till the soil the, it, it, there are, there's a covenant with the land of Israel with the mountains with the trees with the with the land with the soil that once again they will feel the feet of Israel on them again and he's not just talking Judah no he's yeah. the connection of the people and so there's got to be either an awakening or a connection to the land that comes from people in the nations that just really desire to connect back to Israel, to connect to the land, connect to the Jewish people, which would be their brothers. So how God's going to do that, that is up to him. But this is what prophecy well, says. In, in the Old Testament, he says in a couple of different ways, I placed eternity in their hearts. Mm -hmm. And it, I, I love when you, when you think about the kingdom ideas that this is a temporary visiting place. And we're made for a kingdom that has nothing to do with this mud ball we call earth. Right. And yet, the connection from the bud of the rose containing the entire DNA of the rose, that bud is in every one of us, that eternity placed in our hearts. It's designed for the glory of God to be revealed. And in its fullness, the entire earth will be covered with the glory of God. That the way. entire earth. The, it says the whole creation is waiting for the restoration, God's wow. restoration of his kingdom on this earth. You know, it's, it's not just, you know, we, we think about, well, in the, in the by and by, you know, one day I'll get to heaven and I'll live there eternally. But that's not what the scripture says. He is going to restore this earth. When he marries the spirit world, heaven, the spiritual Jerusalem, with the physical Jerusalem, right. heaven and earth will be married again. And he the will. The new Jerusalem coming down. Coming mm -hmm. down. And so this earth will be in its, in its, in the beauty that he had intended well, for. And he never told the, Adam. He never told Adam to reign in dominion over his spirit world. Well, he placed him in the garden. He placed him in the and garden. He said, "This is yours." Right. The, Name it. The man. And, and I, take care of it. Exactly. I think that you know, being in, made in the image of God, we begin to realize that we are not just physical beings. God made us as spiritual beings as well. 
we have a soul. We have something that will live on in eternity that's different than any other part of his creation. Long after the corruptible body can't do this anymore. That's exactly right. Now the question is, is who can claim your soul whenever this body gives up? Who has rights? Who have you made God? And so this is... Who is the Lord? Who is the, the Lord of your life? The landlord of, of your life. soul. Right. Who have you given your soul to? Wow. And when you die, there's, there's going to be a claiming of your soul. And so as, as, as we give our hearts to God and we claim and we proclaim, declaring that he is our God, he begins to change us and, and make us new, giving us a, a, new, a new heart, a new mind washing our mind and, and, and showing us his ways, writing his ways in our heart, writing his Torah in our heart, we begin to emulate and do the things that Jesus did. The things that come naturally in that other kingdom. They're inherent in us. Yeah. And, and, it, and it, you know, people talk about grace. Well, grace doesn't mean you have the license to sin. People say, well, I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. Grace doesn't mean that you don't have to obey the law. It means that he, he loves his law so much, his ways so much, his instructions so much that he writes those laws inside of your heart and they become the very tapestry of who you are and you inherently begin to do good. You be inherently be do, begin to do the things that Torah prescribes. And it's the grace of God that changes us and empowers us to do that. He changes us, he empowers us, and he keeps us on the right path. You know, that's what a conscience does. When you begin to do something that's against your conscience, you'll have that little little voice or a little tug or a little push that says you're falling into a ditch. Get back in the path of righteousness. And so it also affirms to us when we're doing the right thing. That's the, the grace of God working in us. That's what grace is. Having been a, an addict to pornography for 25 years, when I read that scripture that says we were all once slaves to sin, mm -hmm. I, I think to that idea of slavery. Uh, the slave never casts a vote. No. Uh, the slave never says to the slave master, um, well, I'm kind of thinking about it. The slave never says, you know, not today. The slave obeys because the slave has no choice. Mm -hmm. But scripture says when we've been born not only of the flesh, but also born of the spirit, that we're now born again with a new master. That's right. And that slave master is righteousness. Mm -hmm. He which cleans means our slate. We, we are designed now to instantly respond to the voice of the law, the keeping of the Torah. Right. The response to righteousness isn't purity and holiness. It's that's not what happens to us. What happens to us is the call of righteousness says, I now have the ability mm -hmm. and the desire mm -hmm. and the passion to obey and follow the law when the law speaks to me. Exactly. And you know, it says he gives difference. us the desires of our heart. And a lot of people think, well, I want a Mercedes Benz. He's given me that desire. I'm going to get a Mercedes <laughs> Benz. But what, the, what, he, what this word is saying is that he begins to write a brand new way in us. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new creation. So he's giving us these new desires in our heart. And we begin to do things that we didn't do before. He's giving us those desires. And Amen. so we, ha we have to realize it's not that we get to do what we want to do. It's that we, we actually we have a new want to do. We have a new want to do as he becomes our Lord and our master. So when we come back from the break, I want to talk about um, how God got your attention to change your life in, in the pursuit of this journey. Because I know there are a lot of people out there who are, they may even be watching this and thinking, I've never known Jesus to cause me to change everything. I, I, I know Jesus saved me from hell, but, but this idea that I would have to do something differently, uh, that our church doesn't teach that. So when we come back, I want to talk about how profoundly God impacted your life okay. to cause that change. We'll be right back after this. Sweet. That is so awesome. It smells good. I can see that <laughs> without my glasses. Instead of just looking at the circle going, well, there's like 10% of it left. How long, how much did we go over, Jesse? Uh, 15 minutes. Sweet. <laughs> we went over 15 minutes? We were okay. at 15 minutes. We, we did a total 16 minute segment. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So that gives us. What? That was random. <laughs> <laughs> so very Aubrey. <laughs> right. Yay. I'm glad for you. <laughs> Trade places with the iPad and the laptop, please. She's flashy. Okay. Move the, yeah, you can move the iPad and put that there. Now, 
how complicated it is to start, stop, and reset time? Not complicated at all. Yes, I did. Good, you're the pro. <laughs> all righty. Once again, if you're watching on Facebook, we're going to challenge you to check out Insperity. You can actually go to Insperity.com, look at all the different services that they have. But if you want someone to come to your office and sit down and visit with you for a few minutes, Frank Day would love to do that. And if you're in Indianapolis or San Francisco or L.A., 214-699-9650, Frank has agents available all over the world to help you with those same things and a lot of different opportunities in different countries depending on what the laws are there, but Insperity is well-versed in all of those tools and they would be delighted to help you. Anything to do with HR, payroll, uh, medical benefits, anything like that. Anything you would do if you had an HR team but your company's too small, they're the right people to help you. One to 10 employees or all the way up to 3,000, they can, they can hook you up. Call Frank Day at 214-699-9650. All right, timekeepers, we are back. You know what? Um, yeah, we'll do eight, and then we'll do a four to close. So, roll it. Hey, welcome back to Meet the Messenger. So glad you stayed here with us today. We are having a lot of fun with a very deep conversation, so I hope we haven't lost you, but I hope we've sparked your thinking. You know, there's one thing that we know about life is it always comes with trials. And when we experience those trials, those tests, they're not designed to make us quit. God never designed those to make us walk away, to give up on him, to lose our faith, or to begin to hate the nature of our God, but to instead draw us closer to him. And unfortunately, just like math and Algebra 1, which none of us loved, well, maybe some engineers did, um, we keep taking the test until we pass the class. And the longer you fail the test, the <laughs> more you're going to take the same test. You might have some remedial after school, summer school classes to pass the test. But God's grace for us says, I really want to transform you into the image of my son. And to do that, you've got to pass the test. Not that tests are designed to break you, but they are designed to make you into something else. Uh, Dr. Victoria, you were talking about the journey that, that brought you to this place, and you said something pretty profound. You said, in that time when I was outside of my body. Now, I wanted to carry on with that conversation a little bit further because there are some people who start a conversation like that and instantly people go, <laughs> they want to back up. They're like, wait a minute, what kind of lunatic are you out of your body? I hope through part of the conversation that we've had in the last segment, people understand that your knowledge of scripture is not secondary or tertiary to the understanding of the word. It, this is not something that you look at and go, okay, so this is the experience that I had and this is what I found in the Bible that, that kind of uh, is a good proof text for my experience. But instead, God used that experience to push you deeper into the study of the word. word. Yes. And that's a different thing. Mm -hmm. I've seen uh, books about angels mm -hmm. and you read them and you go, that's not even scripturally sound. Mm -hmm. And that's frightening mm -hmm. because there are people who build doctrines on that. One example that you used was uh, the Lutherans mm -hmm. uh, have a very high church mentality. Mm -hmm. um, they have the idea that your infant baptism that will save you. Uh, but they don't have a strong emphasis on evangelism. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that comes from Martin Luther and the 95 Thesis and the, the push away from, I have to have a priest, I have somebody to look right. over me, I've got to be able to obey these people and pay them and, and mm -hmm. do my penance, etc. And so the independence of the Reformation created a certain mindset that they follow. Mm -hmm. The Baptists are, are basically missionaries first. Mm -hmm. Go ye therefore and preach the gospel. So everything else kind of falls behind their missions. Mm -hmm. When you get into things of the spirit and angels and demons and death and life after death or life before death or death before life, and then you get real close to the cults. I believe it's the Mormons who hold the idea that we were all pre-incarnate. And so there's some really scary stuff when you get into that and to think, how do you build a theology around that? Mm -hmm. So tell me about this experience. Okay. And while you're telling me about this experience, I, 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 wanna, I wanna feel the answer to the question, where was Jesus okay. when all this happened? Wow. Okay, well, I did not build a theology around this. I was sitting there scratching my head going, what has just happened to me? You know, you, unless you actually have a death, and, and some people do. I mean, in this day and age, a, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of medical breakthroughs to bring people back to life after a heart attack or after some type of a shot to the body or a drowning. We have this ability, and people have stories. And unless you've been there, you really don't really know what to expect from you know your, now, your, are we your death experience. Death as resurrection or death as resuscitation? 
resuscitation. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, I was in a hospital, so they did bring me back, but I did experience the process of dying. And when I came out of that, um, I had to just I had to just deal with and process what just happened to me because I didn't have words to explain it. I, I kept a lot of it to myself at first, and then I, eventually I started talking about it a little bit. I noticed that a lot of people do that who have had these types of experiences. So it's not like you go to Starbucks and go, hey, you know what I experienced the other day? And no. somebody goes, yeah, me too. No, no, <laughs> this is not, this is unusual. And, and there's just no way to, if you, you're wondering about yourself too, like, was that really real? Yeah. But you know it was real, but you just don't really know how to process this. And so um, my husband, whenever I, I, I came to out of the coma that I was in, I began to say things to him that, you know, just didn't sound like, you know, this was a normal situation. I said, you know, I, I, I saw an angel and he told me I need to, to acquire more knowledge and help my people. And, you know, he kind of thought, this is drugs talking. <laughs> but, you know, I wasn't even on drugs. They took me off of everything. And, wow. and so, because I was having such adverse reactions to the drugs. So I was, I was, out, I was not on drugs. And, um, but this is what, you know, that I, what I took away from it. Whenever I was face to face with this angel who was, you know, just a brilliant, bright, I, you know, he, somebody asked me, how does his face look? Well, I couldn't see their features, although I knew they were there because there was such light emanating from him. Wow. There was like an amberish, golden, orange, uh, beautiful bronze light coming from his face. And we were able to communicate, not with a mouth, but just through our thoughts. Right. And um, he told me that I needed to go back, and I'm looking at this body that's in, that's in terrible shape, and I said, I don't wanna go back in there. And I kinda argued with this, this angel. And he says, no, you ha you're not done yet. You're going to go through your life in real time. I, didn't, I failed to tell you that whenever I died, I actually saw my life, not my li past life pass before my eyes, but what would be pass oh, wow. before my eyes. And so as I, have, ha as I have been experiencing my life in real time, I'm realizing I saw this what, on what I call my grid as I passed through this, this grid of time in a very warped speed because I was going so fast through it. But he told me I was going to go back through that, that experience in real time, and I was going to acquire these irrevocable gifts from God, and that I was to teach others about it. And so it became my, just my focus. I was so, I was driven to find truth and find the word and, and, and what felt right with me, because a lot of things weren't feeling right as I was, as I was uh, you know, just evaluating our spiritual uh, position at that time. And I was very, very young. So, you know, it was, a, it was a process that brought me to this point, a, a revelatory process. We've got to realize that every denomination, though, started from this first century seed, this first century matrix. We all have this in common. And all the de denominations that have ever existed, and there's thousands, by the way, that are Christian denominations, that shouldn't be. You know, Jesus said, you know, may they be one as we are one. Yeah. And so, you know, what happens is when a denomination is created, it leaves somebody behind. So you're always breaking off and leaving you know, something else back here. But if we all go back to the beginning, what did Yeshua say? What was the first century all about? When he spoke to his believers, his followers, what was he saying? What language was he speaking? He was speaking in Hebrew. What idioms was he using? They weren't Western. He wasn't a European, he wasn't American, he wasn't a Western thinker. He was a Hebraic thinker. Wow. And so all of this is what, you know, is, is what I think God led me to, to, to find out this information, what he said from that Genesis, and then teach it. Wow. Our time is really getting away from us fast today. Um, those of you who are watching, are, are you fascinated? Do you think we should have Dr. Sarvati back maybe for another program? When we come back from the break, we're going to wrap things up for today. And if, if we can convince her to come back and stay with us and visit with us again, uh, then we'll certainly make that possible and we'll make it available to you. If not, I can certainly encourage you to visit her website. There'll be a lot of information there. When we come back from the break, we'll talk about her book where you can walk through the grid, the timeline, the stories, the revelations, and the education that has brought her to this point. We'll be back right after this. That's so much easier to see. Yeah. Any Facebook comments? The green is easier to see, but it's counting down already, and I'm not. <laughs> no Facebook comments? A few. A few? What do they say? Sarkada's words are have shaken me with 
Yeah. 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 Ye
that's your destination. If you can't see that, you're going to run around naked, cutting yourself with knives and acting like the prophets of Baal because that's the life you'll live because you don't understand there's a consequence for it. We must fear God. That is the beginning of wisdom. And if we don't have that, then we're going to find ourselves on the wrong side of prophecy. And the contrast to that, the reason that I bring that up is you talked about God giving you a forward-looking vision of what your life will be, could be, in obedience. Mm -hmm. And I think we look at Joseph, who had that dream vision that came ahead of him, and he looked at it and went, wow, I've got to start this now. And, and God went, no, hang on a minute. <laughs> it took a while for me to. <laughs> you need, need to kind of grow you up a little bit into this vision. And, and you can't just walk today at 17 or 18 years old or whatever no. Joseph was and sit on the throne of Egypt. It, takes it doesn't time. work like that. Mm -hmm. But there are so many young people today that, man, they want to jump into that vision right now. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, if I've got a vision, then the world should step aside and let me live it out. And yet we forget that our purpose on earth isn't success. No, it isn't. Our purpose on earth is to be made Christ-like. And is to advance his kingdom and to be obedient to him. And, you know, just because you're in a place, you know, that maybe isn't the ultimate. I mean, think about it. In your youth, you are not at the ultimate place. You are being to, under, to understand and more wisdom of God to be imparted to you. Amen. Well, we are flat out of time. Just a Little Girl, memoirs of Dr. Victoria Cervati. Uh, go to victoriacervati.com and grab a copy or go to Amazon. And after you read the book and your life is deeply impacted, I want you to take the book and share it all over social media, and then I want you to go to Amazon and leave reviews and let everyone know how it's changed your life, how it's impacted your life. If you've ever been curious what it's like to be a mother who buries their child, what it's like to be experience death and then life again, what it's like to actually see a vision for your future and have an opportunity to walk it out, this is a place to see it. Dr. Sarati, thank you again for your time today. Thank you. Very God honored bless. that you were here. Thank you for watching Meet the Messenger. I am your host, J. Lauren Norris. Have a blessed day. That's a wrap, Facebook. Thanks for staying around. I need to change shirts. I need some oregano. I need some thieves. And we need to mic up and focus on Ron Betts.